So far today, we've assessed what kind of income you'll need in retirement, and also if your portfolio will be viable to actually get you that income. But for a lot of investors, the answer to that question is going to be no. So we're going to spend this last session looking at some, po- at some things that you can do to help bridge that gap. I'm joined again by Maria Bruno. She's a senior retirement strategist from Vanguard. Maria, thanks for joining us again. Thank you. Good to be here. And Christine Benz, our director of personal finance. Good to be here. Um, so before we um, really uh, get going, Maria, I just wanted to ask you about when is it time to start maybe being concerned that you're not ready for retirement? At what age is that uh, something that you really need to start making some changes? Yeah, I would say probably five to ten year mark. At is least. A good the one. earlier least. the better, right? And I hate to say concern, but more question. Um, because then if you start to question, then the concerns can come out whether they really are. <laughs> Um, and the reason is, is because if you are in that position where you think you're falling short, you, you've got some possibilities on how to turbocharge either your savings or things like that. So the earlier you can do that, the more proactive you can be in terms of understanding when you can make that switch and, and what the dials are needed. Christine, what are some rules of thumb about uh, deciding if you have enough depending on your age? I like some uh, benchmarks that Fidelity has put out, and people can find them on Fidelity's uh, website. The and they're very rough rules of thumb, but I think a lot of people are just sort of looking at this as a black boxy thing. They have no idea whether they have enough. So Fidelity's benchmarks would be two times um, salary at age 35, four times salary by age 45, and by age 55 to have seven times salary saved. For people close to retirement, um, one rule of thumb that David Blanchett often uses is um, that you should try to have 25 times your spending target at retirement. So um, if you're very close to retirement, that's something you can, can, can use. If you do find yourself falling short, though, uh, it might not make sense just to make your portfolio more aggressive to try to make it up. Uh, and David Blanchett uh, cautions uh, why that could be a problem. One thing that, that retirees who aren't on track for success may be tempted to do is to uh, swing for the fences and invest in a very aggressive portfolio. And I would, I would caution that approach because while it, it may work out in your favor, right, you really can't afford a significant loss just before retirement. And today is, is not the right time to do that. I mean, individuals might start day trading and things, and uh, really you should think about, about safety first. While, again, it's tempting to say, well, you know, David, I'm behind. Um, I have no reason not to take on a lot of risk in my portfolio. Uh, I would say, well, that's potentially true, but, but what if you miss? What if all of a sudden the markets go down by 20 or 30 percent? Uh, I think in that instance, there's a very good chance that you wouldn't actually stick it out, right? Investors who stayed invested post-2008 actually made money, right? If you can stay invested for the long haul, you're not going to be worse off. The problem, though, is that, is that if you're doing this based upon emotions to do something, there's a very good chance that, you know, if, if, you, you, if, if things go wrong, you'll, you'll pull out and won't realize the benefits. And so I really caution people to say, make sure that your portfolio is consistent with your, your risk objectives, not just to, you know, try to fund a given goal. Maria, finding the next uh, hot stock tip is not the thing that's mm-hmm. going to save your retirement. What are some of the levers that uh, a potential retiree can, can pull then? Yeah, I agree with David. And um, when I talk with the retirees or individuals that are thinking through retirement, it would be really to focus on increasing contributions. So making sure that you're maxing out tax advantage accounts for both you and your spouse if you're married. Um, and take advantage of catch-up contributions as well once you reach age 50. Both employer-sponsored plan as well as IRAs allow you to contribute more. So those are some tools that you have in your toolbox. Certainly from a budgetary standpoint, if you can curtail some spending and then use those monies to flow into savings, that's an obvious one as well. It seems like a lot of these things go hand in hand, right? That um, if you can jack up your savings rate even a little bit, if you can consider pushing out your retirement date a little bit, perhaps curtailing your in-retirement spending target and start thinking through some lifestyle adjustments that you could make to support a lower spending mm-hmm. rate in, in retirement. And also in the mix would be, which we talked about, the delayed Social Security filing. Yes. That mm-hmm. All of those variables together, and they do all kind of bunch up together a they little do. bit. Right, yes. So thinking about some of them in tandem. But if you are getting close to retirement, does it make sense to be putting money into a traditional IRA? You're just going to have to take those RMDs out again. At what point uh, should you just be saving in a taxable account? Um, Maria? Well, I think it does vary by individuals. Um, there are, I mean, certainly the more you can max out tax-advantaged accounts, you can take advantage of that compounding on the accounts. 
word of caution, though, as we've talked about with required minimum distributions from these tax deferred accounts. So be mindful in terms of where you're directing the contributions. Um, Christine and I actually have talked about this as well. I mean, you can also invest tax efficiently in a non-retirement account uh, that builds tax diversification if you don't really have that throughout the years. So, um, and it gives you flexibility in terms of accessing those monies as well, too. So the first course, I think, would be one to make sure that um, you know how much you're saving, and then secondarily would be what type of accounts. But I still am an advocate for maxing out tax-advantaged accounts, even if you're close to retirement. You won't, the benefit of the compounding won't be there, but nevertheless, there may be some tax benefits. So, at, um, excuse me, so Michael Kitsis has argued that those years when you're kind of an empty nester, but before you retire, could be a great time to catch up. Um, why does he think that's the case, Christine? Yeah, I love this research, and people can find it on Michael's Nerd's Eye View blog. <laughs> The reason I like it is because it's so um, positive that people, I think, ma many people in their 50s, for example, perhaps they've erred a little too much on the side of providing college funding for their kids and raising kids as expensive, period. And so they're finding themselves in that period, maybe between age 55 and 65, where they really have to use those years for playing catch up. And the thing I like about Michael's research is that he demonstrates that if people are in their peak earnings years during those years and they're able to really crank up their savings rates, so the example he uses is in his article is um, for 15 years prior to retirement, if they're able to save 30 percent of their incomes, it goes a long way toward making up a shortfall if you can kind of turbocharge uh, your savings later in life. So it's not a lost cause. I guess that's a message that I would send is some people think, oh, gosh, I'm just going to have to work work forever. And I sometimes hear that from people I know. And the fact is that there are still some things you can do to make your situation better. It's never a lost cause. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But not everyone necessarily has that budgetary room to add those extra contributions working longer may be part of the, mm -hmm. uh, are part of the equation. Maria, what are some of the benefits, uh, maybe beyond the obvious, of why working longer can help your retirement plan? Well, I think it's twofold. One is if you're working, you're still contributing, potentially saving. And then that also delays having to spend from the portfolio. So you've got a stronger wind in your sale going in once you start spending from retirement. Even if it's part-time income, that's less spending um, or reliance that you have in the near term on your portfolio and allowing that to grow. And that can also go hand in hand with delayed Social Security filing, yes, too. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Correct. Christine, a lot of people, though, the dream of retirement is not going to their job anymore. Um, you know, are there kind of creative ways that people can maybe find income that's not part of the career that they've had, you know, for most of their life? Yeah, I think that that's well worth thinking about, especially if you have a job that has is, has not been a joy to you. There's um, no good to be had from sticking it out in a job that you absolutely hate. That's That might be good for your financial health, but it might not be good for your physical or emotional health. So if you are in that position of feeling like you cannot continue to slog away at your current job, you should think creatively. Um, and Mark Miller, contributor to Morningstar.com, has written a lot about these encore careers. He calls them this idea of picking up work later in, in life. It may not be as remunerative as the work that was your main career, but picking up work that you find to be fulfilling and earning some income can maybe get you part of the way there. You can potentially delay full withdrawal mode for a while. You may be able to delay Social Security. Maybe it's consulting in the industry where you kind of have your expertise. Maybe it's working part-time at a job that you think is just fun. So, in fact, I've talked to my husband. I'm going to be in the Whole Foods cheese department, I think, because I love Whole Foods and I love cheese. Um, but I think just being creative, brainstorming, and um, one thing that came out in the roundtable video that we did with the retirees, they did miss that collegial aspect of their work environment. If you know that you're someone who has really derived a lot of gratification from your work friends, think about getting some sort of second career where you can keep that social activity going. Uh, before you said that, I was going to reinforce that a lot of them may think about going into more social type uh, environments because they enjoy that socialization because they may not be getting that from their prior career. Right. Mm -hmm. Mark Miller does warn, though, that it can be challenging to work later. You can't 100 uh, percent count on that, and he had this to say about it. From a retirement plan standpoint, the right way to think about this is longevity from age 65. And the gains from age 65 have also been impressive. They're up about 10 percent since 2000. Uh, men, the average expectancy now is uh, a bit over 86. For women, it's a bit almost 89. 
Uh, but the thing to remember there is those are averages. So people hear these numbers and they those numbers get stuck in people's minds and think, well, that's the number they're planning to. But of course, some will exceed those numbers and some will not make it to those numbers. So that can be a challenge uh, to you know not know how long you're going to be planning for uh, and to know how long you're going to be able to, to work for there. Um, but still, um, you know, you could if, if you're not able to work longer, you have to look at the other side of the ledger, which is spending. Um, Maria, where are some places that uh, you know retirees potentially could reduce that that spending load? You know, I think Jeremy, that's a good question. When you think about spending, I like it into two types of spending: discretionary versus non-discretionary. So non-discretionary are the things that I had mentioned earlier, where it's to keep the lights on, so it's food, it's housing, those types of things, and you know, insurance premiums, those things where um, you really need to take care of on a day-to-day -day basis. Then there's the, not, the, the discretionary, which would be maybe leisure travel, those types of things. Breaking down expenses with just that first two cuts, I think, is very beneficial, because that'll help you determine what flexibility you might have because um, certainly if you need to curtail spending, it would be on the discretionary piece of it, at least even if it's temporarily. Healthcare costs are something that we've discussed could be a big part of that retirement spending mm -hmm. smile, particularly in later years. Are there any ways really to, to cut that or to think about reducing it, maybe in the long-term care space, Christine? Well, I think it's just important to be mindful of what long-term care costs can entail. So I brought um, some facts about long-term care, and this is from Genworth's annual cost of care study, and it's a really great resource. I know as I've compiled these uh, every year, I look at 50 must-know statistics about long-term care, and I've relied heavily on this Genworth study. So they just have some uh, median costs of long-term care outlays, and one thing that you see is that um, they do vary pretty significantly. So the median annual cost for a private room in a nursing home facility um, nationally is about $92,000. But you can see huge swings based on geographic location. So naturally more rural, outside of big ur urban centers, it cost of care is a little bit cheaper and much more expensive in big urban settings. So uh, Manhattan takes the cake. Manhattan, New York, um, $164,000 in annual cost for a private room in a nursing home facility. So take stock of, of those costs and how they could change. Relocation could be a viable option. Absolutely. So, Christine, I know that you've uh, worked up some examples of kind of what this would look like in practice, how that might be helpful to, to go through now. Um, can you just walk through uh, a you know, theoretical retiree and what they could do to, to really get themselves ready? Sure. So I prepared an example, and the goal was to illustrate how there's not usually a single aha solution for solving a retirement shortfall problem. So the example I worked up was a 58-year-old person earning $50,000 a year who expects to need about $40,000 in retirement. So she's got a roughly 80% uh, income replacement rate. So she knows that if she takes Social Security at age 66 in eight years, she'll get about $23,000 a year from the program. She has $140,000 in her 401k and $25,000 in an IRA, so $165,000 in total retirement assets, all tax deferred. So she can invest $12,000 additionally per year. That's how much in her budget, even though she can get up to $24,000 as someone over age 50, her budget allows $12,000 in additional contributions in that 401k. She has a pretty conservative portfolio mix. So she has 30% stock, 50% bond, and 70% cash. So she has a pretty conservative mix. And Given that, her expected return from that portfolio is pretty muted over the next eight years between now and when she retires. So I kind of lowballed the return expectations for the major asset classes, but um, in aggregate, we come out with a 2% expected return for that portfolio mix over the, the next eight years, which frankly I think is, is realistic. So um, a few more details onto the next slide. Her port portfolio's estimated value if she retires and makes those additional contributions and earns a little bit of growth would be about 315000 the issue is, as we've talked about, she's got all her money amassed in traditional tax-deferred accounts, so she's going to pay her ordinary income tax on those withdrawals. So after her taxes, she'll have just under $300,000 um, in take-home uh, withdrawals from that portfolio. So her safe 
withdrawal rate, given that, assuming she's using like a 4 percent guideline, would be $10,000 and change from that portfolio per year in year one of retirement. So that, combined with her $23,000 expected from Social Security at age 66, rolls up to be $33,000. That's short of her $40,000 target. So what do we do? And this is a common scenario where someone's getting close to retirement. They see that, well, I'm short of where I hope to be. So an obvious thing to look at would be, well, can you try to reduce your in-retirement spending? But for a lot of people, that's not an option, especially with someone like this, where she doesn't have a lot of room for error in her budget already. So what can we do to help bridge the gap? So a couple of things, a couple of ideas, which may or not be tenable, depending on the individual. Let's assume she can find another $3,000 in her budget per year to invest between now and retirement. Let's further assume that she's willing to delay retirement just a couple years, like not even out to the age of 70, but say she can retire at 68, and say she gives her portfolio a little bit of a more aggressive cast, not full-on equities, which unfortunately I'm a little worried some pre-retirees are overdosing on equities, but gives it a nudge toward toward equities so she has a roughly 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio, no more cash in the portfolio because she's not close to retirement yet. So with those tweaks, we can see that her Social Security benefit increases from 23000 earlier to $30,000. And with a higher expect, expected return from her portfolio because she added a little more stock exposure and higher contributions for a longer period of time, uh, so assuming she retires at age 68, her portfolio's estimated value at that point 10 years from now would be roughly $382,000. And we're not assuming really heroic returns from stock and bonds still, but we're putting a little bit more into stocks and bonds. So after taxes, assuming she's in the 15% tax bracket, she'd have $325,000, roughly, available for withdrawals. Her safe withdrawal rate would be about $13,000, again, assuming a 4% initial withdrawal. So the combination of the delaying Social Security and enlarging benefits from that standpoint and making a few tweaks at the contribution, retirement date, and portfolio level, all of those things come together to help bridge the gap and get her comfortably over her $40,000 income target in retirement. So that's just an example. I would urge any retirees who are looking at this or any pre-retirees who are looking at their own situation and seeing that it looks likely that they will fall short relative to where they hope to be, see if you can make some moves around the margins um, that are comfortable for you from a lifestyle perspective to try to bridge the gap. So no one silver bullet though, exactly. that's going to make this mm-hmm. work. Um, we're going to take some questions in a minute, but first I did want to touch on reverse mortgages. Uh, Mark Miller had done some research on this, and he's going to talk about why retirees may or may not want to consider these products. If it looks like your retirement plan is falling short, I think home equity is definitely something worth thinking about in the broad sense. So uh, it's, it's often one of the largest assets in any uh, household balance sheet, and so the options, I think, start with thinking about downsizing. You know, in many cases, it's possible to downsize your housing, pocket some equity, invest that equity, reduce your out-of-pocket costs for housing. And that's where I would start in thinking about home equity. That's a highly personal choice, obviously, but it's really a valuable thing to think about. Beyond that, we have reverse mortgages, um, the home equity conversion mortgage, or HECM for short. And... Um, This is a program that has struggled. It's still not very popular. The surveys show that most people are not interested in them. Uh, The program went through some reforms a few years ago that to try to make the loans safer, um, easier to use, and there are some decent options there now. Uh, It's possible to get a very low cost uh, HECM that can be used as a line of credit, for example. Uh, I think generally that's a safer way to use a HECM than uh, using a lump sum drawdown. It's still important to be very careful. There have been problems with uh, defaults on these loans and foreclosures that need to be avoided. A lot of the reforms were aimed at that. I do think it's something that can be worth a look if it's done carefully with some expert help. As I, I would still say kind of a last resort. Our first reader question comes from someone who describes uh, what they describe as a forced retirement at 60 before they really expected to stop working. What kind of advice would you give someone like that who really had planned on working longer, but uh, it just isn't going to be in the cards for them? 
Yeah. I think that's an unfortunate thing. Uh, and but see. very common. It is common, and you know, not everybody retires by choice. Sometimes it's a situation where it may be forced upon them. I think in that situation, there's a couple things to think about. One is, well, how are you going to close that income gap? Um, but then also things like health care in terms of, uh, you know, in the situation that might have a COBRA or some extended health care coverage, but pre-Medicare health care costs could be significant. Um, Social Security and when to elect that can come into play, too. Um, but I think the biggest focus in that situation would be how to close it on that income gap. Would you agree? I would that? agree. And, and I think, um, you know, some people may really start to explore early permanent retirement at that point. But I think unless you check in with an advisor and know that your portfolio is in really good shape, I think I would be inclined to say if, if you can still work to continue to try to find employment um, for at least a few more years, in part because of some of those um, health care costs. That's what worries me, uh, perhaps more than anything. Yeah, and the challenge may be it may not be the type of work that you may have been used to, um, but it may be an employment that can keep you fulfilled, but while also meeting these, these, um, these income needs in the short term. We have a question from a user from California. I was thinking of relocating to a lower tax state, kind of gets that relocation piece mm -hmm. we talked about during long-term care. Anything they should watch out for uh, in assessing kind of where to move uh, within the U.S. for lower taxes? Well, I guess a couple of things. One is the, it's the, um, the personal situation in terms of where you might want to live in terms of either we talked about family right. or even, you know, the cold weathers versus winters versus warm weather winters. Um, State income taxes is one consideration. I think we, Christine had alluded to long-term care. Like you need to look at the state as a whole, not just the income tax, because um, that could change over time as well. Um, yeah, no, I love that advice. And, and the good thing is there are some tools, and you periodically see articles that try to benchmark the best and worst states oh, yes, to retire yes, into. Yes. And many of them do try to take into account tax rates, whether um, withdrawals from various retirement accounts are taxed at the state level. All of those things can come into play. So don't just focus on your property tax or your state income tax rate. Look at the whole gamut of taxes that you may face as a retiree, um, as well as some of the lifestyle considerations. That is a good point, because retirement distributions and some other types of income flows will vary by state in terms of whether or not or how much they're taxed. Right. We've had a lot of questions about advice, uh, and there's one uh, from someone who said they actually had some pretty bad advice uh, through accumulation, uh, put in a lot of high-cost funds uh, that, that have been losing for years. Um, if, if you're in that position where you've had some bad advice, um, is there still time to turn it around? Where would you go out to seek maybe uh, another opinion that could help get you back on, on track? Yeah, I would say simply because you haven't had good advice in the past d does not mean that all other advice will not be good. There are plenty of um, very, very competent professionals in the realm of uh, financial advisors and financial planners. So um, do your homework. I personally always recommend the fee-only model. It's just uh, I, it makes sense to me that the that the decisions the the advisor makes on your behalf or the recommendations shouldn't be tethered to commissions in any way. So I would say perhaps start with that fee-only. Um, type advisor and look for someone who's a fiduciary, whether there is a fiduciary rule in place or not. I think that's still something to ask any prospective advisor about. You know, are you uh, legally required to look out for my interests before anyone else's? I think the CFP credential is an important one to look for to make sure that the person has a basic, at least a basic grounding in um, the key aspects of a financial plan, maybe not just one little area, but the whole gamut. Mm -hmm. So I would look for those three things, fee only, fiduciary, and CFP. I would agree. And the CFP board website will have, if you put your zip code in, it, it will have a network of advisors who are certified as well. Um, but advisors, you know, they'll, they need to provide their disclosure brochure um, as part of the initial discussion. So. I think that is how they're compensated, what their investment approach is, their investment philosophy. Those things can come together um, holistically to make you feel comfortable. I often recommend the um, website napfa.org, which is the, the group of fee-only financial advisors. Mm -hmm. so that's a good place to try to sort on advisors in a given area. Uh, we have a question about creating value for yourself before retirement, that if you do end up having to, to work longer, is there anything you can do to maybe make those years a little bit more tolerable? Uh, what are some potential solutions there? 
One thing we were talking about off camera, T. Rowe Price did some work, it must have been like a decade now, but I thought it was really impactful where they looked at um, someone who understood the benefits of staying in the workforce, that ability to delay retirement withdrawals, continue to earn an income and so forth. So if someone buys into the fact that, okay, I've got to continue working, it's better for my financial health, the T. Rowe Price research pointed to it, if one thing you can do to make it palatable for yourself is to not focus so much on additional contributions. What T. Rowe found was that those late in life contributions are tend to be a little less beneficial than the ones that you would make very early in your career. So if you can free up a little bit of spending money by not saving quite as aggressively, if it means that the trade-off is that it makes working more palatable, so maybe you can do that trip to Disney World with your whole extended family, spend some of the money that you would have otherwise saved, that that is a good trade-off all in all. So that's something to consider. Ideally, you'd continue to make those contributions, but if um, it's a way to make yourself, to make it more palatable to stay in the workforce, that's one idea. Well, I just have one final question then, kind of as a capstone for today. Uh, what would really be your final piece of advice to pre-retirees or retirees? Uh, Christine, what would you say? Uh, I only get one. <laughs> <laughs> I would say... Piece, piece of advice, we should say. Get help. Because as much as I'm a believer and I see so many of our enthusiasts on Morningstar.com creating their own really sensible portfolios, get some sort of a second opinion on your plan. At a minimum, get an investment buddy to keep an eye on, to help you keep an eye on what you're doing to use as a sounding board for your plan. I think that that can be really, really valuable. I had a dad who experienced cognitive decline, and I was his buddy through that period, but I, I want everyone to make sure that they have a trusted, knowledgeable person working with them on their financial plan. So whether that's a paid financial advisor or maybe just a very trustworthy, financially savvy adult child, whatever it is, get yourself some help, get yourself that sounding board. Yeah, I would agree. I would add a couple points. Um, one would be try to simplify. So, you know, later in life, you may have different types of accounts. Try to do consolidation to keep the portfolio management as easy as possible. Um, and the sooner you start, the more confident you feel in your decision making. And it's not once and done. You want to go back and revisit that plan um, and just keep it alive as you as you progress. And, um, you know, for many, as we saw during the video today, it's a very enriching, rewarding experience. So it can be. Um, with anything, it's try to do your education and feel more confident in your decision making. We're in, Christine. Thank you so much for being with us all day uh, and for helping us kind of assess retirement readiness. Thank, thank you, you. It's great to be here. Thanks. And thank you for joining us. Just as a reminder, we'll have replays of all of these sessions available on Morningstar.com soon. So stay uh, tuned there to see when those will be available. We'll also email everyone who's registered for the event those links to the replays directly. We're also going to compile all of the picks from our panel with Karen Wallace uh, so that you can see uh, some of those great investment selections as well. Again, thank you so much for joining us and have a great day.